This week, it's going to be uh, so much fun because we're going to be talking a little bit about conflict. Say conflict. conflict. Say fighting. fighting. Who loves it? <laughs> I got like, yeah, tricked. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe that's right. And, and this is kind of how I want to introduce this topic because I think, it's really, I think it's really fascinating that why is it that when we need to be at our best, in moments of conflict, in moments of fighting, in those crucial conversations that we need to have. Why is it that when we need to be at our best, we're often at our worst? Isn't that true? Man, we're reasonable, sensible people. But when that one topic comes up, we throw the gloves off and start saying things we don't even mean. Why? Why is that? That's crazy. When the stakes are the highest, we're at our lowest. When, when we're in challenging conversations with a boss, a coworker, a loved one, it's like adrenaline kicks in and we start to say things we don't even mean and react in ways we don't even mean. Let me tell you a, a common problem that every single human being on the face of the earth shares. Um, it's called the fight or flight response. Anybody ever, ever, ever learned about that term? It's, you got these little glands, they're right here, the adrenal glands, and and. It used to be when you saw a lion on the road or when like bandits came in to like raid your farm, you could like, the adrenal, the adrenal glands would kick in and they would give, they would rush blood to your biceps and your legs and your heart would start pounding so that you could like fight off enemies. Well, the last time I saw a lion was at the zoo. He was sleeping and I was like trying to get him to wake up. I couldn't get him to wake up, you know, like. Things have changed over time. But one thing has remained the same. We still face conflict. But we've got these glands in us that are encouraging us, showing us, telling us, screaming inside of our own bodies to say, fight or flight. That's something that you and I all were born with and we have. That's why when we, are, when we need to be at our best, during conflict, we're often at our worst, and we, we retreat into conflict, or we retreat into violence or silence. The same thing that used to save our lives many years ago now makes us act like animals when we need to be reasonable. Now, the threats have changed over time, but the trigger is still there, conflict. Now, I first read the book that I kind of got a lot of the points from. It's called Crucial Conversations. It's called Crucial Conversations. You can write that down and look on that. It's a very scientific book, actually. But the reason I read it was because I was going through a situation that maybe some of you can resonate with. Let me tell you about it. I was with my direct supervisor. Now, I've got accountability. Tiffany and I have accountability. We have uh, somebody that's like our direct overseer, and they, they just check in on us, make sure we're not like, you know, we're still preaching Jesus and making sure we're healthy. You know, they check in with us and we check in with them. And we were in a little meeting in a big living room. And there was like 20 other people there. And the story goes where I was at this camp and I had talked to somebody from my, my supervisor's church. I talked to somebody and I'm a musician from way back, way back. And so I ran into this musician from his church and I was like, just talking. I was like, hey, we should jam sometime. Yeah, you can come over and jam anytime. And that person interpreted that statement as, what, you trying to get me to go to your church or something? <laughs> oh, and I didn't know that. I didn't even know that. that. That was not made clear to me until in this meeting, my direct supervisor in the middle of, the, 20 people are there in front of everybody. And says, oh, by the way, and looks over at me and says, next time you try and scalp one of my people, you might want to ask with me first. And I was like, do do, 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 and the gloves went, and I, because you know it's a, it's adrenaline. It started to flow inside of me, and everybody in the room was like, oh, burn! It was like funny, kind of, but it was like sarcastic, and maybe he meant it, maybe he didn't. Nobody was sure. But you know what I did? I stewed about it for like six months, and had conversations with him in my shower. <laughs> Y'all laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly, yeah, when your boss says that one thing and you're in the shower washing and you start saying all the things you wish you would have said in the moment, 
You know, except you ain't saying it to anybody. You saying it to yourself in the shower, and then your spouse is in the room going like, what is going on in there? Six months. Six months. And so finally, I talked to one of my other mentors, one of my other pastors. If you know anything about me, I have a, I have a very wide circle of people that have permission in my life to speak into my life. And one guy, uh, his name's Matt Lacey over in Pleasanton. He, he, he just, we were sitting down having a meal, and he said, man, what's wrong with you? And I was like, oh, man, this just been this thing. This is six months later. This is this thing on my mind, man. I can't shake it, man. This person who's like means so much to me said this thing, and I have not been able to shake it. Like, I can't shake it. I can't get away from it. And he, and he said, you need to go read the book, Crucial Conversations, and you need to have a conversation with him in the next two weeks because this is pointless, what you're doing. And so I went, and I went and met with, I, I scheduled a meeting. I went with uh, my pastor who was like my spiritual father. And I went and sat with him and I did all the things I'm about to explain to you from the book. So I'm about to explain the steps I had to go through. And I, I sat down with him, I was like, hey, you know, when you said this right here, it, it made me feel like this. And it led me to believe you were saying this. Is that true? And he said, no, man, I was just kidding around. I didn't mean that at all. You know what he said? He said, I'm so sorry. I didn't, even, I didn't even know it came across that way. Six months. Six months I was suffering. <laughs> suffering. When all I needed to do was go in and have a crucial conversation. Go in and have the conversation that, that needed to happen. You know, and, and this is what happened. When I was in with the 20 people and I was in there, we, we have a fight or flight response that I'm going to call silence or violence. Violence would be step. Well, who do you think you are talking to me like that? And then everybody looks around. That's violence. But then there's silence where, where most of us, I think most of us fall into this category where we silently stew. Sarcastic comments, cold shoulder, silent treatment. That's what I did. I, I was in um, flight, silence. I was letting my glands tell me what to do. Instead of being a reasonable human being and saying, you know what, I think I can address this. So for the rest of our time together today, I'm going to talk to you about how we can, how we can move past that. I, I don't want that to be your story ever. I don't, want, I don't want any one of us to ever have to go through that agonizing reality ever again. Like we can go into these conversations and have what I'm calling life-giving conversations. I actually put it up here. Instead of crucial conversations... I'm calling them life-giving conversations because we've gone these conversations right with our parents, with our kids, with our bosses, with our coworkers. They turn into life-giving because now life has occurred from there. And my worship team is laughing at me right now because I've used this term quite regularly with them. Every time someone steps in late, you know, we all kind of mumble, it's time for a life-giving conversation. <laughs> when I come in late, they say, it's time for, do we need to have a life-giving conversation, pastor? Ha, 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 chuckle, chuckle. But it's language that I've cultivated on that team where it's not weird. It's not uncomfortable. It's just normal. Hey, it, I'm seeing that you're late or let's, uh, it, it seems like this is how you feel about it. Is that true? It's a life-giving conversation. It's just addressing what needs to be addressed. And this is what I want to start with. Um, these crucial conversations, these life-giving conversations, three things I've learned from the book, condensing them down. Number one is this, start with the heart. Start with the heart. I'm going to butcher this person's name. Ambrose Bierce. It was Ambrose Bierce, I think that's how you say it. But she said this, speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. Yeah, y'all are like, yeah, I know. I'm like in the throes of it right now. We just ended that speech right before we walked into church today. <laughs> um, no, that's none of you, right? No, I, I've never been through that personally. No, 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 no. Speak when you're angry and you will make the best speech that you'll ever regret. But it was Solomon who wrote this in Proverbs 12. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The difference between piercing like a dagger and bringing healing comes from your own heart, comes from your own goals, your own motives. Do you want to be right and win the argument, or do you want to bring resolution? Check your heart 
what's your goal? What you, check your heart. We can't quote him anymore. We can't quote John Christ anymore. I'm just playing. There's like three of you that are like, I get what you're talking about. I get what you're talking about. The rest of you are like, what is he, is he supposed to be telling a joke right now? I don't even get it. Check your heart and what is your motive? Do I want to win or do I want to bring resolution to this situation? Like that's as simple as it is. So when I go into my meeting with my pastor, what's my goal? Is, is my goal for reconciliation or is my goal to prove to him how wrong he was? That's, that's a big question. That's a big question. The, it seems obvious but when you're operating from those adrenaline glands, you want to win. You want to win. So Solomon says, check your heart. Because the words of the wicked are like daggers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick you and stab you until you realize I'm going to poke all these holes in your argument. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know exactly what I'm... This is a fun topic, isn't it? This is fun to talk about. This is great. Or is your motive, you know what? I, I really want to bring healing out of this. I want to see resolution. I want to, I want to bring, I want to bring, the, the win should be resolution. Let's illustrate that. There were two young girls. Now, just ride with me to see if you've ever been involved with this. If you have siblings, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There were two young girls who were at Disneyland with their dad, okay, and they drank enough soda to choke a donkey. All right, they drank like 126 fluid ounces of Pepsi each, and they are riding all the rides, and it's going up and down. Their bladder is like this big. They get back to the motel, these two sisters, these two young ladies, and they both got to pee like racehorses. They've got to go. It needs to happen right now, but they get to the bathroom at the same time. Now, now the reasonable thing to do would be to say, Okay, one of you can go first. 60 seconds later, I get to go. But no, this is a true story. What do these two girls do? Fight for 20 minutes, yelling at each other, calling each other names, saying, you always get to go first. Oh, yeah, well, dad was, you're dad's favorite. And it's like, you don't even know what you're fighting about anymore. The reason why you're dancing like that is not because you're mad. It's because you got to go. When the, when the, when the, when the outcome becomes secondary, like actually resolving the issue becomes secondary because you want to win so bad, you know it's gone all bad. It's gone all, it's stupid, right? It's just stupid. But we do this. We get so caught up in being right and winning that we lose track of what's most important and what the goal even was. The goal was to go to the bathroom. Nobody's adding to that. Nobody. Have you ever been in a place where you're fighting with someone and you can't even remember how it started. All of us. All of us. You can't even remember how it started. Why? Because the issue isn't even the issue anymore. It's all about winning. It's all about fighting. Both people. But if even one person, that means you. <laughs> it ain't the other person. If even one person, that means you. The true, if the true goal was to bring resolution then we, we could have got on the other side of this. Because if one of those girls was like, all right, you can go first, then it would have been over. But no, it becomes about winning. It becomes about, no, I'm right, you're wrong. We gotta, we gotta fight that like the plague. We can't, we can't afford that in the body of Christ. This only happens when you let winning override healing in a conflict, which leads me to my next observation. Write this in your notes. Avoid the fool's choice. Avoid the fool's choice. Let me explain to you what the fool's choice is by this quote from the book. The mistake most of us make in our crucial conversations, in, for our purposes, our life-giving conversations, is we believe we have to choose between telling the truth and keeping a friend. Like, if I tell the truth, I'm going to lose you as a friend. Or I can keep you as a friend by bending the truth. That's the fool's choice. That's a fool's choice because that is never the only two options. Never. That's the fool's choice because the Bible says it this way in Matthew 18. If your brother or your sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. First of all, we need to just address it. 
So that's the, that's the first part, just addressing what's going on. Don't hide from addressing something that needs addressing, but there's a right and a wrong way. There's a right and a wrong way, which I'm about to get to. I'll go over that in detail. But let me show you like, what this can look like in a less threatening way. Um, it's probable that from an early age, you learned how to do this. When grandma was feeding you some of her famous Brussels sprout pie a la mode. Anybody like grow up with some kind of, in my house it was spinach lasagna. It, it, it doesn't sound as bad as it really was. It was, ugh. Okay, and then grandma sets the plate down in front of you and says, do you like it? And what you hear is, do you like me? Right? That's what we feel like. Like, I can't tell the truth and keep a friend right now. Because if we tell the truth, grandma, this is the worst thing you've ever done. This is the worst right next to making my parents uh, this is the worst thing you ever did right here. That was a grandparent joke. Man, you know, like three people are like, yes, that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about. You say, oh, uh, grandma, this is terrible. And you look at your grandma's face. She's brokenhearted. And you decide, you decide right then and there, I am going to now forevermore, I'm going to keep my eyes open for times when I have to choose telling the truth and keeping a friend. And we've done it for the rest of our lives with our boss, with our coworkers, with our spouse, with our kids. I can't say what the truth is because I'm gonna lose a friend. That's the fool's choice. That's the fool's choice. We don't have to do that. We've done it with everyone. We think that if we're honest, we can't be kind. And if we're kind, we can't be honest. But Paul wrote this in Ephesians 4. Instead, we will speak the truth, say it with me, in love. We will speak the truth in love. There is a way. It is absolutely possible. The fool's choice in Christian terms is truth or love. Like I either, either need to be loving or I need to tell the truth. Like it's somehow impossible to do both. Like I can't speak the truth to you and tell you what's true without, without being kind to you. It's, that's a fool's choice. We don't have to buy that. Truth or love is the fool's choice. The thing we can get out of it is this. If you go in to these conversations with the right heart, what's my motive? The right heart, the right intention, keeping the desire to bring resolution and healing on the forefront of your mind, you can be successful in having life-giving conversations, but you have to do this next part, which is write this in your notes. You have to keep it safe. You gotta keep it safe. And that's the responsibility of all of us here today. Remember the title of this series is It's Not You, It's Me. I need to keep it safe. It's, my, it's not the other person's responsibility. No, it's my responsibility to keep things safe. When fight or flight or silence or violence kicks in with either you or them, it's time to move. It's time to move. Step out of that conversation. Step out of it. The right words at the wrong time or the wrong words at the right time can be disastrous when the stakes are high. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about having conversations when the stakes are high. Man, as a pastor, I've had more of those than I think I ought to. But the stakes can be high in these conversations, and we need to remember, man, when, when things are starting to elevate a little bit, man, sometimes we just gotta, we gotta reset. We gotta take a break. We gotta take a little reset, and we gotta recalibrate. Listen to, what, listen to how the Bible says it. Solomon wrote this in Proverbs 25. The right word at the right time. The right word at the right time is like a custom-made piece of jewelry and a wise friend a wise friend's timely reprimand. Notice that. You can say the right thing, but at the wrong time, like right before bed. <laughs> like right before bed. Or like right before he's about to go up to preach. You can say the right thing at the wrong time. That was selfless right there. That was a selfish, that was a selfish little plug for myself right there. You can say the right thing at the wrong time, or you can say the wrong thing, like maybe it is the right time to have that conversation, but say the wrong thing. But we need to use strategy and wisdom when it comes to this. And, and when there's a lack of safety, when you can feel a lack of safety in the room, ask yourself these questions. Um, I didn't put these in your notes, but maybe you can jot these down. Ask yourself this. Does this person I'm talking to, does so-and-so believe that I care about their goals? Because, you know, there's always two sides of every conversation. There's, there's what the other person wants and there's what you want. 
And to have a successful life-giving conversation, you have to first listen for what you can discern and figure out what they want and not just know it. Because you can say it till you're blue in the face. Yeah, I know what you want. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're trying to say. No, no, no. That's not enough. The thing you need to do is, is communicate that you care about their views. Does this person believe I care about their goals in this conversation? Another one is this. Do they trust my motives? Now, it's, like I said, it's not enough for you to just believe inside of yourselves that you have right motives. It's the art of conversation to communicate that those motives are good. Hey, you know, what I really want out of this conversation is for us to be reconciled. Say it. You know, you can, believe, like, you can know it here, but ask yourself, do they know that my motives are good? Ask yourself that, because a lack of that can remove safety out of a conversation. Another question is this, do they believe I respect them? Oh, this one, this one's key, because we just don't, we just don't respect. I just don't respect your view. Like, yeah, I hear you and everything, but you're wrong. You know, that's just how we kind of live. That's the, that's the American way. I know what's right, darn it, and I'm going to tell you all about it. And if you don't get it, you need, to, you need to open up your ears a little bit, son. You know, that's just how we get down. No, 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 no. Do they believe I respect them? Because if your goal is not just to be right, but if your goal is to bring restitution, resolution, and harmony back to relation, this is a relationship series, y'all. If that's your goal, do they believe that you respect them? Not just do you respect them, have I, have I shown them? that I respect them. That, that's what the question is. Have I shown them? Once you've restored safety, you can go back in and, and stay focused on finding and staying committed to a mutual purpose that you can find. This is something that I don't want you to lose. This is in your notes right here. Write this down. Don't avoid what you can't ignore. Amen. But do it right. But do it right. Too often, we do what I did. We run away because, man, that's my boss. I don't want to have this conversation with him. What if it goes badly? But I couldn't ignore it, but I was avoiding it. Can I give you some quick advice today? Don't avoid what you can't ignore, but do it right. Take some of these tips I just gave you and, and, and use them to make a difference in those conversations. Go in with your wits about you. Go in prepared. And you will be surprised that if you go in with the right heart, if you go in with the right motives, if you go in seeking restitution and reconciliation, you will be amazed at those assumptions that you made were wrong about what they want or what they did or what they said. But it's on, it's on you. It's on me. You, you can't change them. You can only change you. The one thing in common with all your relationships is you. And what you can bring to the table is, no, I'm, I'm going to bring light. I'm not going to avoid this. I'm not going to avoid this. I'm going to go in with the right heart. Um, but we have to do it the right way, with the right strategy and the right motives, because I, I just wanted to show you kind of what I felt like. This is the tools. Th this is like the tool that we're built with, okay? When it comes to conversations, like this is in our body. This is fight or flight. This is silence or violence. And this little number right here is the conversation that we need to have, Okay? Is this the right tool for that? Front row, are you ready for this? I'm playing. <laughs> what we, and what we do when we go in just, you know, trusting our gut and just being like, you know what? I just need to face this. I need to do something about this. I just need to, ooh. Do you want to eat? Man, did we really? I can't eat that. Man, that ain't, this is not the right tool. Man, if someone's coming for your life to pillage your farm, yeah, pick up a hatchet. But you know what? We're, act we're not doing that. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. What we really want to use is something like this. Okay? We want to take, this is the conversation. This is the tool. This is the strategy I'm about to share with you. Is we want to take, how many pieces do I want this to come out like? I want to come out like, hmm, like a nice wedge. You know, if I just get in there like, oh, yeah. Nice and smooth. And how many pieces do I want? We just need to trade tools. We need to trade our adrenaline response, we need to trade our, our primitive instincts, fight or flight, we need to trade that 
for some biblical tools in our conversations, for some biblical tools. I just wanted to paint a picture for you that these examples I'm about to give you right now, that is what this is. It's like using a, a, a nicely sharpened knife rather than a hatchet for your conversation. So let's talk about that. I want you to remember this, this uh, statement. It's actually an acronym, STATE, S-T-A-T-E. And the rest of the message is, is words that start with that so that you can remember. Man, how do I need to go into these conversations? And the first letter is S, and it goes like this. Start with the facts. So just start with the facts. Not your story. That comes later. Now, let me just paint the picture of what that actually looks like. Because facts are not controversial. You know, when you start with just plowing into your conclusion, because the conclusion is your story. The conclusion is what is the conclusion that you've drawn in your own mind. That's a story. We want to start with facts. Remember how I described it? Hey, uh, pastor, when you said this, in this context, it made me feel this way. Like, I'm just starting with the facts here. I'm not painting a picture of you being a, you know, hog beast and wanting to hurt me right now. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to, you like that choice of description right there? <laughs> no, I'm going to start with the facts. I'm going to start with the facts. They're not insulting. The, when we share facts, we earn the right to tell our story by first starting with the facts. The facts are this. For example, I found this charge in the bank statement. Honey, <laughs> I found this message in your inbox. Um, you have cursed at me three times today. You were 15 minutes late. Now, facts take a little bit more work because you can't just, you, you could tell a story about your feelings, but you can't just tell a story about, the, you, you need to actually go and have the facts lined up. And that takes a little bit of work, more work than we're usually prepared to put in to these conversations. We just want to trust our gut. Ah, you're, you're hurting me. Why are you doing this? You know, like we just rush in with our stories instead of starting with the facts. But by starting with the facts, you're not assuming malicious intent. Remember, because we're starting with the heart. My heart is to bring us back together. And so I'm not starting by calling you names. I'm not starting by, by showing you the picture. You're a thief. You're a... You're a cheater. No, no, no. I'm just starting with the cold facts. Hey, I saw this and I saw that. And when you start with the facts, you can do what comes next. Tell your story. Start with the facts. Tell your story. The facts by themselves are not that exciting often. But it's the facts plus the potential conclusion that call for conversation. Notice this example from the book. I thought this was pretty good, so I just pulled this story from the book. This is about two business people in a software company. And so this is kind of how that would look. Um, guy number one says, hey, I noticed that you had company software in your briefcase. Guy number two says, yep, that's the beauty of software. It's portable. And the first guy says, but that software is proprietary. That means it's like copyrighted by the company. You can't do anything with it. And then the guy says, yeah, it ought to be. Our future depends on it as a company. And then the first guy says, my understanding is it's not supposed to be going home. Of course not. That's how people steal it. Uh, uh, but, <laughs> is it, so see how we're starting with the facts, but we're not starting with the story. I didn't, I didn't rush out there. It sounds like at that point, it's time for a conclusion. And that goes like this. Then why is the software in your briefcase? It looks like you are taking it home. Is that what is going on here? Notice that he didn't say, um, why are you stealing that software, you thief? You know, it's like, you could say that, and a lot of people do. It's in your briefcase, isn't it? And then we jump straight to the story. You jump straight to the story. We don't need to like jump out there and call someone a, a thief or a cheat or anything like that. However, if you've done your homework by thinking through the facts behind your story, you'll realize that you're drawing a reasonable, rational conclusion. And that's like, I don't want to be reasonable and rational. I want to, I want to, I want to. You know, hit somebody. You know, that's the caveman inside of you that wants to react that way. But the rational conclusion, one that deserves hearing. This is where most of us get life-giving conversa life conversations wrong. We draw the conclusions before doing the hard work of looking through the facts. I mean, this could save lives right here. Like, if I would have gone into my conversation with my pastor by telling the story before laying out the facts, I would have been bringing accusation to him. And that he would have had to defend, and then we would have been in a battle. 
but we weren't in a battle because I was just laying out the facts. Next part is this. Ask for others' path. Ask for the other's path. Remember when the, when the person said, is that what's going on here? Man, that's very specific language. You're not accusing anybody of anything. Even though in your mind, it's a done deal. You're stealing the software. You're cheating on me. You are this. You are that. In your mind, it's all there. I know it, I know it feels that way. I know it feels that way. But if you take the time, you will be surprised at how often you're wrong. And blessed by how often you're wrong and not having to go, what's going on here? That's a very intentional way of saying it. We demonstrate humility when we do this. Like, I don't have all the answers. I think I do, but I know I don't. So we demonstrate humility by asking others to share their views and caring about their responses. It's basically saying, is my boss trying to macromanage me rather than my boss is trying to micromanage me? It's like, is that what's going on? Are you attempting to do that? Because nine times out of ten, they're not trying. It just happens by accident. But if you state some facts, hey, you like hover over my shoulder for 15 minutes while I was doing a job I knew how to do, blank, 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 are, it seems like you're trying to micromanage me. Is that what's going on here? Don't attack your boss. It's a great way to keep your job. And it's a great way to, to be pleasant and to have the right heart to say, is that what you really mean to do? Chances are, he's not. He's not trying to do that. A small difference that can make all the difference in the world between successful conversations and disastrous ones. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 3. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. We demonstrate our humility by asking others to share their views. The T stands for talk tentatively. This like tiptoeing. Talk with care. Don't ru fools rush in. You've heard that expression. When it comes to these kind of conversations, be tentative. This is like a how-to. Like creep into these. If you want to be successful, I mean. I mean, if you want to be, you know, a, a macho who doesn't have any friends and no job, then yeah, you know, rush on in. It's great. It's good. You know, you, you'll be fine. But if you want to actually keep the relationships that matter to you, then you will talk tentatively. Means that we'll tell our story as a story, not as cold hard facts. Maybe you didn't know, and in my opinion, are great phrases to, to keep things tentative instead of aggressive. Uh, changing language like, well the fact is, into something like, well in my opinion, it seems soft, but let me just tell you, it saves lives, it really does. Or you could swap, well, everyone knows that. In exchange that for, I've talked to three people that seem to think. You see how it takes a little bit more work? But it's, it's, trading, it's training your hatchet for a knife. It takes a little bit more work, but the result is much yummier. It's much nicer. Change your language. This is just having a good attitude translated into English. That's all this is. Did you notice that yet? I'm just teaching you how to have a good attitude in these crucial conversations. And the last one is this, encourage testing. Encourage testing. The phrase like, is that what's going on here? Phrases like, is that what you meant by that? Did you mean to insult me in front of all of my peers? No, Elliot, I didn't mean to do that. Of course I didn't mean to do that. I feel awful that that's what ended up happening. But instead of saying, you insulted me in front of all my peers, I said, did you mean to? No, I'm encouraging him to test the story. I'm encouraging them to, to be able to speak their side of it so we can have a conversation instead of a battle. Usually with conversations like these, we would, we would love to be wrong, wouldn't we? When we're going into conversations like these, we'd love to be wrong about what we think is going on. Actively... Active encourage others to test your story. You might be surprised at how, how, how it's a simple misunderstanding. Or there was information you didn't have. Oh, so many times in my own life, there's information I just didn't have. I wish I had that information if I didn't have it. Um, I got a story to kind of illustrate this. My buddy, who's a pastor in Fresno, um, he, he's got a great young church, uh, a team of people that are like just right there 
um, they're, they're young and they're, they're excitable. And he had this worship team member. He had this worship team member that was chronically late. He was late every single practice. He was late every single Sunday. He was always rolling in late. And what do you think my friend thought right out the gate? This fool, he don't care. He don't care about showing up on time. He don't blah, 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 blah. You know, what would you think? Someone who shows up late to work every day. What are you going to think? You know, there's all kinds of stories that go in your mind. But my friend, my friend showed me a wonderful example of what this all looks like. Because he went in tentatively. He encouraged testing. He said, hey, I've noticed that you've been late this time, that time, and the other time. And I just, I just wanted to get... It seems like you don't worry about being on time very much. Is that what's going on here? And the guy on the worship team said, no. He was a young guy, a teenager, kind of from a broken home. He didn't even own a working alarm clock. Just a $9 alarm clock, and that kid was on time every time from then on out. He wouldn't have even known. My, my friend would not have even known if you just would have rushed in and said, you know what, dude, you're off the team. You're off the team. Man, we don't need losers like you messing up our big groove thing. And, and no, 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 no. He said, hey, tell, tell me what's going on with you. Man, ever since then, every time someone's late, I always assume the best. I have to. Because what if I'm wrong? What if you're wrong? Man, what, what if we're wrong? And what if the person is really just trying, doing the best they can and had no idea the, that their actions or what they were doing, like, because they've never been on time before in their life. But what if we just, what if we crept into that because we cared about them? What if we did that? Don't blow it by always assuming you have all the facts and your story is ironclad. You can train yourself with some humility and arm yourself with these strategies you might find these really tough situations can become life-giving conversations. I mean, now that kid is crushing it. <laughs> He's doing really good. That was years ago. He's doing good now. An alarm clock, a $9 alarm clock. That's all it took. Remember, everybody, don't avoid what you can't ignore, but do it right. Do it right. Life-giving conversations, step one, have them. Step two, have some sense and some strategy. Go in with some love. Check your heart and make sure that you're really honoring the person across from you. That's what it boils down to. Can you imagine how your work environment would change? Your family life, your entire life would change if you learned to use this instead of that. How often has this broken homes? How often is this broken apart relationships that were not destined to fail, but we just didn't have the tools. We didn't have the wisdom. We didn't have the word of God in a practical way to show us, hey, you don't have to do it like that. You don't have to do it that way. If you put these biblical principles into practice, you will see advancement in the workplace. Like you will be promoted. In the book, it talks about how 95% of a CEO's job can be done by a well-educated teenager. But it's that 5% of conversations that are really tough. That's what sets apart executives from a teenager. It's that 5% of conversations. So how would your work life be different? How would your home life be different? How would your spiritual life be different? You think it would be? I think it would. You know, it's a sacrifice to handle conflict this way. It takes more work. Um, but there was someone who sacrificed. There was someone who sacrificed way more than we ever would have to in order to have a relationship with us. Jesus. He laid his life down. He laid his comfort. He laid his place in heaven down. Why? He came with the right heart. Why? He came speaking the truth in love. He was the prostitutes and tax collectors that loved him the most. But he wasn't sacrificing no truth about it. He was speaking it in love. Because his heart was right. He's our model for this. Is that we can have hard conversations and still maintain a genuine love 
for the person across the table from us. He gave up his comfort, his spot in heaven, and became human. Also, that there would be an opportunity. This opportunity right here and right now for us to have that relationship with him. And as you can see with this whole series and most things in life, the ball's in our court. With conflict, with parenting, dating, all of it, all of it, all of it. So your spiritual life right here, right now, what we're going to lead into, the ball's in our court on this one. It's, it's not anybody else, it's us. It's all of us that have the opportunity to engage that relationship, to say, all right, Jesus, all right, Lord, I've tried it my way. It's not working. All right, Lord, the ball's in my court. It's time for me. You already did. This is the funny thing. Jesus didn't give his life so that you would be saved. He gave his life to give you an opportunity to be saved. The ball's in your court. I think it's even more powerful that way. It's one thing to give your life knowing someone is going to be saved. What about giving your life just for the chance? And somebody might even turn away, turn away from it. He gave his life even though you might not decide to. Is that a bigger sacrifice? I think it is. Just to give us the opportunity. And the opportunity is for you. Every single one of us. Everybody listening online. The opportunity is for you right here and right now. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm so grateful and thankful that you have led us to be people of character. You've led us to be people who care and have compassion for one another. That it's the way we love one another that even shows the world that we even believe in you. This is by the way we love one another. Relationships. God, it's so important. And the relationship that's the most important to you is the one we have with you. So I know that some of us here, we're, we're not exactly walking that right now. Maybe you are here and you do not have a relationship with Jesus. You have not given lordship to him. Maybe you know about him. Maybe you heard about him, but you haven't taken that step to say, Jesus, I want to make you my Lord. I want to live life your way. I've tried it my way, and I'm done with that. Or maybe you used to live that way, but something happened. Something happened along the way. Maybe something hard. Maybe something in your spiritual family. Maybe something in your actual family. Maybe a disaster. Something. Something shook you. Maybe nothing at all. Maybe just things got quiet spiritually in your life. And God never moved away from you, but you somehow moved away from him. I want to tell you right here, right now, God looks at you no different and with no shame at all. He welcomes you back with open arms. He says, welcome back, daughter. Welcome back, son. He says it with the same joy and jubilee as he does for those of you who are making that, that choice for the first time today. So if that's you, if that's you and you're ready to give your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm, I want to make you my Lord. If that's you today, heads down, eyes closed. Come on, let's just lift our hands up and say, Jesus, I'm making you first. Go ahead. You can do it right now. Say, Father, I'm making you first. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. I see your hand and yours and yours and yours. I see you and yours. I see you. Hallelujah. Let's all pray this prayer together. Come on, church, nobody praying alone today. Let's commit our lives to him. If you believe it, say it with me with confidence. Say, Father God, I give my life to you. I believe you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for my sins. I make him my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, everybody. Can we celebrate everything God is doing? Hallelujah. So many people putting God at the top of their list. Amen. I just love it so much.